Uh, hi everyone, welcome back to another Thunderbeam podcast and we're back on the Founders Journey Trail today. Um, uh, we've had a week or so off of the pod just because of people's ever-changing busy schedules. Um, but the good news is we're through January. So those of you that were dry, welcome back to the dark side. Um, I hope that was successful for all of you. I have tried it. Um, not failing because of ill discipline, just because January, you know, it's that time of year when everyone else is hibernating. It's quite nice actually to get out and about and talk to people. So talking of talking to people, um, we've got a really interesting guest today and one I've been trying to get on for a little while. Um, I'm joined by Molly Johnson-Jones today, uh, founder of Flexa. Um, first off, hi Molly. Hi. Um, so before we get into Flexa, um, I wonder if you could just give a little bit of a, a, a sort of a, a resume really of how you got to the point of founding Flexa. Where did you start as a, uh, before you kind of founded the company and so on and so forth? Absolutely. I probably had the least um, linear career pathway than the <laughs> most, most founders I say, although I do know most founders actually haven't had particularly linear career pathways either. Probably mm -hmm. weren't right for working for other people really in the end. Um, I started off in investment banking in equity research um, after leaving university. I actually trained to be a chef before that, but... Mm -hmm um not linked to what i do now but yeah i was in investment banking xc research and i did that for about 18 months and um i've had an autoimmune disease that means that i sometimes can't walk and i've had that since i was about 18. and so i asked to work from home one day a week when i couldn't walk when i was in investment banking and um 10 days later they put a settlement package in front of me sacked me and told me to leave immediately so yes. i then left because i didn't really have any other choice <laughs> and um started kind of looking for jobs that would give me a little bit more flexibility than investment banking because everybody knows it's not the most notoriously flexible industry so i was mm. then in market research leading a team of food retail researchers a bit of strategy consulting for a while and then i moved into ux research um, and still strategy consulting before co-founding flexa in 2020. well so i guess um the the need for kind of asking you why you wanted to start flexors uh fairly well answered there um what was your experience just before we get into the business what was your experience when you were looking for jobs with the flexible slant angle did you find yourself that information just was not forthcoming or that companies were uh, not prepared to kind of outlay that info before interview stage and all that stuff i mean what was your yeah. own experience of it? it's a bit of both i think some companies it wasn't intentional that they were withholding that information they just used it as a talent retention tool not a talent attraction tool i think other companies um were much more judgmental about people or me particularly needing to work flexibly i think that for a long time um flexible working has been associated with working mums mm -hmm. and that's kind of the reason that people needed to work flexibly obviously that is one reason that one person can work flexibly but it shouldn't be the only one and so when I, sometimes I would choose to disclose the fact I had a chronic illness, other times I wouldn't, but I always felt like my reason wasn't, wasn't good enough in a lot of companies' eyes. And I definitely went through a fair few interviews where I asked about flexible working and got ghosted. After. When you say not, not a reason not good enough, I mean, generally yeah. not being able to walk is a fairly difficult thing to overcome if you can't work yeah. at least somewhat flexibly. Um, so again, did you find that when you actually kind of articulated the need for the flexibility that people shut off but not because of the flexible because of maybe some other you know pre-judgmental thought process or yeah you know i think people it probably was part of that yeah there was there was a kind of bias against the idea of hiring somebody who was sick sometimes but it didn't stop me from being able to work necessarily i think that one thing that the pandemic in the kind of past two years has done is hopefully open people's minds up a little bit that work doesn't just have to be done in an office but i think before when i was looking for jobs that kind of expectation was well if you can't be in every day then you're less committed than a candidate who can be mm -hmm. i think that was probably <clears throat> the kind of judgment that they had against me in their heads well i i think that rings true i mean i don't spend too much time looking at 
uh, many job descriptions, but that kind of passive aggressive line of like work hard, play hard, like we like to do long hours together because we are a team. Like it's just that sort of you're subconsciously, but fairly overtly saying to someone, we kind of want you in the office. Yeah. And um, so this leads us to Flexor itself um, for our listeners who are mainly made up of, of investors in startups and of course some founders can you can you give us the flexor elevator pitch absolutely um so we say that flexor is the gateway to the future of work what we enable is for individuals to find out exactly what it's like to work as a company so that could be you know remote first working bring your dog to the office work from anywhere schemes enhance parental leave fully flexible hours um all sorts of other benefits that we also measure and consider, and we've built two different indices that are based on hundreds of thousands of data points that we've collected to quantify exactly what flexibility is. So the companies that are eligible to be on Flexor are only actually genuinely flexible. And we don't uh, rely on kind of external crowdsourced information. We actually go into companies and survey them so that we understand what their internal work environment is. That then enables them to use it as probably the most powerful employer brand tool at the moment given that 87 percent of people want to work flexibly so we are a bit like a verified and better version of glassdoor that focuses purely on flexibility and great working environments um that's a really cool summary and um i i hope that it does the job for most people um as a few people will be doing now is kind of googling flexor and having a look um What's super interesting clearly is the, the take up from the uh, employers, um, yeah. your, your trusted list um, is not quite a who's who of business, but it's not far off and some luminary names like Allianz and Biogift and <laughs> some other very big names are on there. Um, before we get into the nuts and bolts of it, is it harder when the company's already got a big corporate structure and super HR like policies and everything? Uh, as opposed to maybe a more nimble or less formed HR policy sort of thing. Um, did yeah. you ha have a challenge with that? Uh, the sales cycle is slower. <laughs> yeah. Um, because you have to get sign off from multiple different people, but it's not necessarily harder. It's just slower. I think we also have different use cases for a very large corporate versus, you know, a kind of medium sized scale up. Like if I, oh. if I compare um, why Paddle, for example, uses Flexor versus why Farfetch uses Flexor is, is quite a different use case. So the big corporates will often come to us for diversity and inclusion purposes mm -hmm. and getting known and differentiation as well. Often large corporates are less flexible. They want to be perceived as like the creme de la creme of, of flexible working. So they will come to us to build a diverse pipeline of talent and to get their name out there as being inclusive and progressive. Whereas um, the scale up companies are more likely to come to us for employer brand purposes, they want to be known as a great place to work. People might not have already heard of them like they have with Farfetch or Allianz, but we can get them known as a brilliant place to work and we can get their employer brand kind of put onto the map so people will want to engage with them and want to apply to them. Yeah, and you, you already touched on the, the length or, or, or the makeup of the sales cycle and you also mentioned people coming to you. Now, presumably on day one of Flexa, the door wasn't being smashed down by corporates wanting to um, work with you how how did you find because this is one of the most frustrating parts of any well not just fundraising process but scale up and startup process pitching and pitch decks and all of the stuff that people just you know have to do but don't really want to do um did you find it easy to put together your pitch because you were coming from the perspective of living in this moment and understanding frustration and knowing that other people are looking for the same thing. Was it a difficult pitch to put to employers, bearing in mind normally they're holding the cards, right? Yeah, um, surprisingly, no. As soon as you explain your own personal experience and the fact that they are underutilizing something that they already have, mm. it's actually quite an easy sell. Um, we have a conversion rate on a call of 65% of people that we take a discovery call with will convert, which That's is very, good. very high. Really high. Um, and since we actually moved into being like a monetized like legitimate platform not in beta uh, we haven't done any cold outreach it's all been through b2b marketing and inbound that's great and um not to get into the weeds of it but have you found that there is one particular b2b channel that suits your business more than others or is there's one that surprised you um i would say that linkedin has been the most successful for us from like an organic and network 
perspective because when someone when a company comes onto flexa they're flexified mm -hmm. and they post about the fact that they are they'll say you know we scored this it means we're super flexible we've been accredited by flexa as such they'll post about that we'll post about that so there's obviously a great network effect that was something that we happened upon and it was incredibly fortuitous that we did um so we actually do generate a lot of leads off the back of that i would say from a from a paid perspective what's been really really surprising is that on the d2c ads that we do for a direct candidate acquisition we actually get a lot of b2b conversions off the back of that because they will see the ads and go oh if i was a candidate i'd use that my company should be on there and we definitely didn't expect that flip side to happen you think b2b ads convert b2b leads and d2c ads convert d2c leads but we've actually had some kind of cross-pollination so do you find it difficult as a business to uh prioritize is the wrong word um i haven't got my word or head on to think of a different word for this but how do you separate the importance of your user base on the business side and your kind of user base on the candidate side do you find yourself doing more of one than the other that you don't want to do or do you find that you've, you've kind of got a nice way of separating the two um well one's easier than the other from a from an advertising perspective d2c is we we quite nicely acquire about twenty thousand users every month and we've never had a problem with it which is very lucky for us mm -hmm. <laughs> um so it does require a little bit less work um and also morris who is sitting behind me my co-founder and COO slash CFO, um, he focuses more on the D2C side of things. So we have split the responsibilities in that respect. Um, from a B2B perspective, ultimately it is how we monetize the business. So we have to be focused on it, but the ads fatigue more quickly. Some you think will work, will not work. Um, and we always have, I'm sure like any business, attribution is always really, really difficult. Like somebody can see you in one place and then suddenly convert four adverts later and you didn't realize where they came from. Um, so we've had to put more work into the B2B side of things just to understand it. Mm -hmm. but we've always been very, very fortunate that our return on ad spends about, we got it up to about 19 times by the end of last year on a B2B perspective. So it's, it does work for us. We've just had to put a lot of work into it. That's really good. And you mentioned earlier about how um, you do go to see every company, you don't use kind of outsource stuff and it's, did you find, of course, you in that you probably had the the perfect storm of of COVID in terms of a, you know a, a weird positive to uh, a pandemic um, in that it's on everyone's lips. But did it stop you going to see companies? How did you? I hate that word pivot, but how do you go from what you wanted to do, which is, I guess is go and vet, meet, talk, see environments, to having to do stuff like this? Um, I think it was a great thing for for us because it meant that everything was more automated. So we, what we did was we built these two different indices and the first stages of the two benchmarking stages. The first is very objective and we built this index that people can measure themselves against. It tells you on a scale of zero to, or actually technically you could get minus 40, but you'd have to be pretty horrendous. <laughs> um, minus 40 to a hundred, how flexible you are, um, which we use as a lead gentle. As I talked about, we don't do outreach. That's our, that's our kind of hook for inbound. Um, and that obviously gives us more data as well. And then a company has to score above 60 in order to be eligible for the next stage. Then how do we know that a company genuinely is flexible using all of the data from our roughly 360,000 users and their preferences? We've then managed to weight um, a kind of perception based index of like what are the most important aspects of flexibility for the market currently. And obviously that changes every month. We update it over time. So then when a company goes on to the second stage, they're just given a, a link, which is a quiz. They put it out in their Slack or whatever messaging service they use um, and their employees take it and we get a representative sample. We see how they score again and we get all of the verified kind of answers of exactly what it's like to work them. That's super interesting because it's then down to the company to get real life feedback from their own staff which may be uncomfortable but very useful um but probably something that a lot of people don't want to kind of face up and do internally um but in order to get or to be flexified um they they have to do that which is great it's cool because it puts the onus on the business to sort their own house out at the same time as uh, it's kind of going through your process um 
which is all very neat, I have to say. Um, what do you find has been like just generally, I know this could be a very long list, but generally, would you pick a particular area of starting and scaling the company that's been a hurdle or like biggest hurdle? Yeah. Is it is there ceilings, plateaus, tech, marketing? What sort of things been yeah. your biggest hurdle? It's always fundraising. Like it's always a funny, it's always a funny one. I wish that I could say that would be more interesting and say there was something else. We have been incredibly fortunate with timing, with team, with traction, with return on ad spend, acquisition, everything is going really well. But fundraising has always been a genuine challenge. Um, we've raised 770,000 so far. Mm -hmm. um, so no small amount, but it's definitely not massive. You know, you see these $300 million deals and you're like, oh, my amount of money is tiny. Um, but it has been hard to get that. Um, but I think there are a number of reasons. I think the recruit recruitment industry, for lack of a better industry, is not very sexy. No one really likes it. There was a big influx of money into it about four years ago, and not very many good things happened after that. It's been a real lack of innovation in the sector. And um, although, in my opinion, we very much operate, we're, we're creating a different category of recruitment. It's about employer brand. It's about top of the funnel um, hiring rather than sitting down in the weeds of job platforms and recruiters. People still hear employment or careers and they run a mile. Mm. Um, I also do think that being a woman doesn't help with the fundraising process and all of the data would suggest that that is also the case. Um, I also think that there's a real um, need to build FOMO and to you know be like, we're the next best thing since sliced, since sliced bread. You have to get in now, otherwise we're going to go. But when you've never raised money before, you don't know that you have to do that. So you're kind mm. of naive and honest, <laughs> um, and you're much harder to, you're much easier to read, I think. And um, I've slowly learned over time how to do things better. But it has been a a real hurdle to overcome. Well, of course, as a platform that offers private equity raising as one of its core things, we know for well the uh, the struggle of some of some founders with the fundraise. Um, it's not great to hear that um, being a female founder has a detrimental impact on uh, fundraising. Um, as you say, there's plenty of data out there to back that up. And if one hangs around on Twitter enough and looks at VC related tweets and startup related tweets, you'll see there's a very common thread. When, without getting uncomfortable about it, what, what aspect of it do you think or sorry, what aspect of being female do you think has made it hardest? Is it because people don't take you as seriously or they don't take the meetings? Or is it like once you're doing the pitch, you don't just don't feel that you're getting responded to in the right way? It's really, really hard to put your finger on it. And I actually think that the fact that it's hard to put your finger on it is part of the problem because mm. then everybody goes, oh, but it's subjective. You know, you're just a woman scorned. You couldn't raise any money. So now you're complaining. And so it's very circular. Um, I find it easier to talk about examples of times that things have happened rather than necessarily being able to unpick it because I wish I could. Um, but there would just be things like I now pitch on my own. But it used to be that Morris and I would, would sometimes pitch together as two co-founders. And um, a question would be asked by an investor. I would answer it and then they would directly address Morris after the question. Mm -hmm. um, or another time we were on a a final round uh, with a VC investment committee meeting, which is going on for a long time. It's about two and a half hours. And um, I had to stop leading the meeting because there was so much animosity between me and one of the partners. I didn't say anything. I just nudged Morris and was like, I think it'd be better if you lead this. <clears throat> and afterwards, because it was with three co-founders um, and both Morris and Tim, who's our technical co-founder, messaged me afterwards and they were like, that was really weird. Why did he have such a problem with you? And it was just me on that. Like, it's not like I wasn't being, a, I wasn't being an asshole. I was being completely normal. <laughs> um, and there were just so many examples of uh, the specific areas where it'd be like, I cover this and I'd have given the pitch about it. And then they would ask Morris or Tim the question. Like, it's just, I'm not, I don't think I'm taking it seriously as male co-founders, but part of the problem is that like, then they are 
not concrete and objective examples. Like it's not like someone goes, no, I'm not investing in you because you're a woman. Right. <laughs> Just this continual feeling of like you're slightly on the back foot and it's really, really hard to explain. Yeah, but the, the figures are out there and the the number of, uh, you know, comparable business metrics from female founders to male founders raising or the amount raised or successful raises is pretty damning. Um, yeah. It obviously depends where geographically. We're not going to paint every place with the same brush. But, um, yeah, it really sucks, actually, because, um, well, for a million reasons, um, but, you know, as if there aren't enough obstacles and barriers to entry to this whole world yeah. um you know having that on top of the thing um we actually had in our notes to discuss any issues of being a female founder and um you know they they've come up um do you find that once you know let's just get past the fundraise that say you, you have raised a small round or a round or whatever yeah and then you're you're kind of feeling like you're okay, ready to go and do a, a block of work have you found any hurdles thereafter being seen as like not just raising, but now as the founder of this business that's doing things at that point, you're kind of. Okay. It's never yeah. been enough. It's never been in operating. It's never been in the role that I have. It has literally only ever been in raising money. And I find that very interesting because other people don't care. They see it. The investors that we have see it as a good thing that I'm. Yeah. It's, it's of different. course. I mean, this is, this is the, this is the weird thing about it. Yeah. Um, and find those people. Yeah. No one wants to paint all of, you know, venture capital or, or venture capital funds or whatever with the same brush, but it is, it's mentioned a lot. Um, moving away from that gently, um, because it's something that we could probably talk about for a long time and maybe not, not get anywhere. Sadly, um, I think we will kind of try and have a, a bigger podcast with a few other People have had a similar experience and see if we can get to the nub of it. Um, apart from fundraising, which we know for most businesses is a real blocker, in terms of growth, um, what were your what were your priorities uh, from day one? Because obviously it sounds great now. You've got 20k uh, new signups a month, etc. It sounds monstrous, but at the time, of course, you're just looking for. Great, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what were your priorities? Did you need to build the critical mass of the user base before the business side of it would mm. take you or, or vice versa? Yeah, it was a really interesting um, kind of conundrum in the beginning. I guess also it's kind of worth caveating when I talk about that journey. Like we were something quite different when we launched. We've actually pivoted, well, semi-pivoted. We were more like a traditional job platform, um, which in hindsight, absolutely would not have, it would have been incredibly expensive to make work. The unit economics of it are nowhere near as good as moving yourself up the funnel um, in terms of co focusing on reach and awareness and discoverability rather than actually getting people to apply and upload their CVs. Um, so when we first launched, we had the idea of doing the kind of job platform thing, getting applications. So from us, from our side, the two sides of the marketplace building was incredibly important because no companies means no applications, no applications means no companies. So we made the decision to launch into like beta basically for free. Um, got some companies on, we managed to get 20 trial companies for free. Um, during the time we were also kind of getting the user base with like largely organic, like a tiny amount of paid spend. Um, and kind of simultaneously building the two, I guess, how did we make that first step into it? Literally the first thing we did was we put up a landing page that was not the website and said, this is what we're building, register your interest. We got to, I think it was about 500 candidates with interest in about a week, which was great. And that's what we went to companies with. We were like, we've got 500 people who really want this. We're gonna do it for free for you. Do you just wanna put your jobs on here? They said, okay, awesome completely ignored us, but 20 said, okay. <laughs> um, and then that's where we started kind of building both sides. We did it for free, obviously, just spending on the GC acquisition for about six months. Um, when by that point, we'd, we'd got to the point of, gosh, probably about 25,000 users um, and about 30 trial companies over that time. And that's when we then decided to start monetizing and we slightly pivoted the business away from job platforms and towards discoverability and verification of flexibility. Well, um, if one were doing a case study on 
uh, user demand, um, you probably be <laughs> a very good candidate to talk to because it's always nice to validate an idea with real numbers in, in a in a fast space of time. Um, just actually, as a, just as a sidebar, how talking to candidates, which I'm sure you you do as part of of your research and everything else, where in the importance scale behind like money, job title, role, and all that stuff mm. is flexibility now? Do you think? Um, it depends on the poll you look at. It's either number one or number two. Right. So people either care about salary the most or flexibility the most. People are less fussed about job title. They'd rather be flexible or paid more. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I think that this, the, the discovery part of COVID over the last two years has enlightened people more than just the idea that, you know, I need Thursday's afternoon off because that's when my kid goes swimming. Obviously, the the things that everyone talks about, and myself included, saving three to four hours a day on a train, uh, let alone the cost implication of that. Yeah. And I've had conversations with people at the bar um, about how much more money would it take now to go back to a commuter lifestyle, like the net netting it off wouldn't matter. Mm. and uh you can't well you know you can look at your yourself and like how much am i worth an hour but how do you buy back approximately 20 hours a week of being on on the move mm. um yeah you literally i don't think you can quantify that like you couldn't pay me to go back into someone else's office i am aware of the irony that i'm sitting in an office right now but it's my office and i choose when i go into <laughs> it but you couldn't make me go into somebody else's office on set days a because i couldn't do it it would make me sick again yeah b i would be so miserable i just like i you couldn't pay me you literally couldn't and i know that there are so many other people out there where okay maybe obviously if you offered a million pounds a year you might do it but like within reasonable salary increases they just won't they just won't go yeah uh look i i'm i'm, I'm with you luckily uh I, I'm pretty much here all the time, but it's it's been a big, big, big change uh, from having to go into town every day. So talking of people paying you and circumstances changing, um, let's just have a quick chat about the long-term vision for Flexa. Um, yeah. The day may come when someone wants to acquire you or do an M&A move with you, and you may be called to become <laughs> something something different as part of another business or whatever. What's your long term vision? And, you know, should something like that come about one day, mm. would you be comfortable working again for or with other people? Or is this very much the baby that remains the baby? Um, for us, I think we want to become the biggest employer brand platform in the world that allows people to find out exactly what it's like to work at a company globally. It's global transparency as our end game. Um, am I in this to? just create that and not make lots of money off of it no <laughs> mm -hmm. um i feel like you sacrifice so much as a founder ultimately you're in it because you know that there is a big upside at the end of it and you could exit for a lot of money um and that is what we want to do whether that happens in three or five years it's the scale at which we grow and you know i think it's i'd say most founders will ultimately be in a big exit <laughs> Yeah, look, it's refreshingly honest as well. There's no point um, sort of talking around the fact that um, it's something. And actually, because you, well, to this point, you've certainly proved your your model here. Um, it's quite interesting to see how you'll replicate it in in other jurisdictions going forward. Because presumably, uh, employers and companies the world over want pretty much the same thing. Yep. Yeah, generally there's a generally there's actually when we look at the data from both sides of what people are offering, there's only like a slight mismatch of it. About eight percent of people want to go into an office every day. Don't know who they are or where they are, but they do exist. And that about twenty percent of companies are encouraging people to go back into the office every day. That's the mismatch. Um, there's slightly more demand for remote than there are remote companies, and hybrid is pretty evenly um, pretty evenly matched against each other. But that's again, you know, the, one of the great things about what we've seen at Flexa is, you know, it's not like it's just candidates that want it, and there are barely any companies, or vice versa. There's been a nice matching of the liquidity on both the D2C and B2B side. 
I feel like those people must be under 24 living within a 10 minute commute of the office and single um, and no children. Um, having, having points Tuesday through Friday every evening. Yeah, God, the glory days, if only. <laughs> God, it seems a while ago now. Um, let's move away from age very quickly. Um, so I guess the, the bit that um, we like to do here, so last, our last podcast is with the founder of Reebok, Joe, um, who gave some very illuminating uh, advice at the end, but it's kind of more life advice than anything. Um, I do like to ask uh, our guests for advice for aspiring founders specifically, because yeah. there are people listening to this who may be uh, in the process of scribbling down their first idea right through to being uh, ready to pitch for their first funding round or whatever. From your own experience over the last few years, what do you have one or two pieces of solid yeah. advice that you would, you would like to give out i have one piece of advice which is never listen to anyone's advice Very <laughs> and good. Still everyone's telling you the same thing i will caveat that um when you're starting out in your early days everybody will have an opinion about what you're doing everyone like even if they don't understand your product or you they will have an opinion you can absolutely guarantee it and there will be a enormous number of people that will tell you that you're an idiot and don't sacrifice it. you had a good career what you're doing this is a massive risk everything's going to go wrong people love to see the negatives and things you have to ignore them in order to make any progress and everybody will have an opinion about your own individual product about exactly the direction you should take it and we wasted so much time in the early days listening to those people sometimes taking their advice and it was actually really detrimental, like really detrimental. Um, so we started to get much more discerning about it. And we only listened when like multiple people were telling you the same thing. So like, you know, just the same as if suddenly everybody is telling you that you look shit in a certain pair of trousers, don't wear those trousers anymore. But if one person has a problem with your trousers, ignore them, that kind of mm -hmm. thing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that's what we did and actually that was that was a way way better way to filter that down and i think the world is so full of constant advice i did this you should do this you know i've seen all these other people do this it's just noise and you need laser focus for the very early days in order to get over all the obstacles that you're going to face and i'm sure if someone had told me of all of the shit we'd have to overcome in two years i probably would have gone no i'm a care job i'll start a business but yeah. you definitely don't know until you're going through it. But to get through it, you have to ignore everybody. It was interesting what you said at the beginning of your um, advice flow there. And this is something that I think a lot of people don't get uh, or understand is the uh, the intertwining of your business idea and your personal life. Because when you decide to do something like this, not only does everyone have an opinion on your idea, they have an opinion on how it affects your life too. And therefore, vis-a-vis, -vis, it does affect your life, especially friends and family because you know it's not like you're just taking a new job in a questionable company you're yep. taking a questionable path and especially parents brothers sisters and those close to many of us have an opinion on the path um more than they do the actual business idea yeah um did you have any issues well not issues but did you was that a, a thing you had to sort of deal with as well um because there's support right there's supportive people yeah but there's people also well i'm very supportive but i'm also very worried about this you know luckily, and i will back you but you know <laughs> luckily no my mum i grew up with mum who was a single mum she had me when she was 19. she's had to take a million and one risks and i think she was like you do you if you can if you can build something great and make lots of money then why wouldn't you take the chance um and i know that obviously other co-founders and other people that were in the company had like a luckily they had supportive family as well I definitely think that some of my friends were very very shocked they were like what are you doing <laughs> um I think people often find it hard to kind of be a bit more objective about these things and like if they were offered that opportunity like in something different or if they wanted to start a business like they they find it very hard to think objectively it's all very subjective about their perceptions of you and their perceptions of your idea um that i think it makes it very hard to filter out but generally people were pretty supportive one thing that i did find that was very funny was we were always asked in the early days like oh are you going to raise a family and friends round?" i was like with with what money <laughs> <laughs> none of my friends or family had any money and i found it so funny that i was surrounded by 
lots of really young founders that were like, oh yeah, I raised a 200 grand family and friends round. And we're like, okay, <laughs> how? Tell me where these rich family and friends are. <laughs> Well, look, it's um, it's actually really, it's actually refreshing to hear someone sort of speak quite openly about this stuff because you know I think a lot of founders develop the the facade or the cold front or the kind of you know game face of like yeah it was tough but I sort of soldiered through and now look at me. So it's nice to hear that there's you know there's some normal people out there as well. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna let you go shortly because you've probably got other stuff to do rather than just chat to me. Um, one thing I'd never asked actually, but I just dawned on me mainly because of the industry you're in and the way you've built the thing. Um, as a founder, uh, digitally, I guess, what's been your favorite tool? I say really favorite, maybe most of Slack. Genuinely, Slack. that's such a boring answer, but we're a fully remote team. We meet once a month. We have a really lively Slack channel. People like in our team, we're a team of eight plus a couple of freelancers. People love it. We all know each other really well. It means that we can work asynchronously. Voice memos are one of the best things that were ever invented because it means you don't have to have a meeting. Yeah. Um, and it has, without Slack, I don't think we'd have grown so quickly because stuff can just happen instantly and you get to build a culture, which means that you have a team that are much more engaged. So I know that's a really boring answer, but genuinely Slack. No, I, it's, I'm not surprised. Uh, I'd never really used Slack properly until I joined Thunderbeam and we are super Slack, like everything is everything. And um, it's a very intuitive way, I think, of staying in touch with all things, but without having to be notified of all things all the time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, very happy. Um, okay, I am now going to let you go. Um, but thanks very much for coming on, and um, we'll let you know when this is published. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure chatting to you. That's very sweet. Um, now, uh, listeners. Um, I have another one to record this week. Um, some of you will be familiar with Investor Tumas, the fictional Estonian investor who's been around for 10 or 12 years and has made a lot of money. Um, maybe he's not so fictional anymore. Um, but in, on that note, I hope everyone has a good day and we'll see you next time. Cool.